life determines our problems but our mind determines their size <clears throat> the bhagavad gita is spoken at a very fascinating setting the fascinating is that there is a big battle about to start and in that battlefield it's action that is most required action so that arjuna knows how to how, that he has to fight over there and although fighting is so important at that particular time still krishna does not tell arjuna uh, simply to start fighting some people say that arjuna the bhagavad gita was spoken to get arjuna to fight a war in that sense it's a violence inducing book <clears throat> especially some extreme leftists they try to create a equivalence between the bhagavad gita and say some other text that people use to justify religious violence but we'll see that in the entire bhagavad gita uh, there is not a single call for revenge there is nothing that we might call today as hate speech if you see if generally if somebody is to be incited to do some violence the easiest way is to get them to uh, to manipulate their emotions to get them to think of uh, the bad things that were done to them uh, and now terrible bad things were done to the pandavas and among them the worst the most painful the most infuriating the most horrendous was the attempt to dishonor draupadi in public uh, if krishna's purpose had been simply to get arjuna to fight then krishna could have just reminded arjuna just remember the humiliation that draupadi was subjected to that remember the the Uh, this the in terrible insult that were done to all of you remember how powerless you were at that time now do you at that time circumstantially you were powerless now are you going to make yourself powerless and not do anything but it's remarkable that there is not a single mention of that incident in the bhagavad gita so you don't generally if you want to get somebody to do something aggressive that we generally we, we manipulate their emotions and we select those incidents that will lead to the manipulation that will trigger their emotions the most so why does krishna not mention this incident at all the gita does not use the situation at all to incite arjuna in fact if we consider the gita has a very uh, unemotional spirituality if we consider the bhakti which is talked about in the bhagavad gita in the shrimad bhagavatam and the chaitanya charitamrit we will see that the emotions increase substantially in fact the the most significant message of the gita is of the most significant message is of how one can stay calm सुखे दुखे समय कृत्वा न प्रहृषेत प्रियम प्राप्य नो द्विजेत प्राप्य चा प्रियम दैट डोंट गेट एक्साइटेड वेन देर इज प्लेजर डोंट गेट डिजेक्टेड वेन देर इज पेन एंड जस्ट स्टे फोकस्ड स्टे स्पिरिचुअली फोकस्ड एंड देन इन कॉन्ट्रास्ट इफ यू सी इन द भागवतम भागवतम देर इज मच मोर डिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ हाउ द प्रहलाद इज अब्जॉर्ब्ड इन भक्ति हाउ द लॉर्ड इज एक्चुअली वेरी डीपली हाउ द डिवोटीज uh they just lose themselves internally in meditation in the lord and chaitanya charitamrit is all about dancing in ecstasy losing all external consciousness so therefore there's a big big difference between all of these and what is the uh, reason for the difference it's context for arjuna at that particular time Uh, his emotions were coming in the way of his service of his of his doing his responsibility and that's why he was told subordinate your emotions and then <clears throat> when he was uh, in the bhagavatam for 
for for Parikshit Maharaj, he had more or less turned away from the world, so it was become absorbed, become absorbed deeply devotionally. And Chaitanya Charita Amrit is, it's almost everybody is unmindful of the material world. They are focused simply on absorbing themselves in the Lord. As unmindful, unmindfully absorbing themselves in the Lord. That's what the so there is a progression in that devotion, in the emotion within the devotion. So we have to see, although bhakti is, uh, although devotion is ultimately love, which is emotion. So devotion is not just emotion; it is conscious, continuous cultivation of pure emotion. And sometimes, for cultivating emotion, we have to restrain emotion. Because if the emotion is distracting us from doing the activities that are meant that are going to help us cultivate the emotion, then we need to restrain that emotion. So that is the mood of the Bhagavad Gita. We could say it's almost that is the bhakti or it is the unemotional spirituality. Unemotional, of course, if you consider y-axis and x-axis. On the y-axis there is negative y-axis, there is the material emotions. On the positive y-axis there are spiritual emotions. So we want to develop spiritual emotions, but we may need to uh, we need to free ourselves from worldly emotions before we can develop spiritual emotions. So the Bhagavad Gita is more about uh, Arjuna. Don't get caught up in the emotions that may come upon you during the war. So having said that, now how does Arjuna? Uh, so what is the message of the Gita? Message of the Gita is Arjuna. You focus on your dharma. On your duty, which is in this case, you are, as a devotee, you have to fight the war. So Arjuna starts with uh, the idea that he comes with the plan to fight, but then on seeing his uh, relatives, especially Bhishma and Drona, he feels I can't fight. So the the vision that is provided by the Bhagavad Gita helps him to rise to spiritual consciousness. So let's look at how uh, the three modes shape our vision. And thereby we can see how we can shape we can shape the vision in a way that will be helpful for us to function when we face difficulties. So, what basically, what do the modes do? See, the soul is here, the world is here. In between, the mind is there. And now, the mind is primarily where the modes influence us. We could say the whole world is also influenced by modes. Uh, prominently today, it's passion and ignorance. But it is how much our mind gets infected by the modes that shapes our perception of things. So when we are looking in the world, basically we human beings live constantly at the junction of things that are. Out of our control and things that are in our control. We live at the junction between the two. So, if we imagine, say, a large circle, or we imagine a big circle, then within that big circle there is a tiny circle or a small circle. The big circle is things that matter to us. The small circle within that is things that are in our control. And within that, there could be a far bigger circle of things that don't even matter to us. So things that that we can control, things that matter to us, and things that don't matter so much to us. So now, if we consider the modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance, in the mode of goodness, our vision focuses on the things that are in our control, and we deal with them. In the mode of passion, we focus on the things that that matter to us, but that may not be in our control. So the second circle, and the third circle is things that don't even matter to us, and we obsess over those when we are in the mode of ignorance. So the Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita the characteristics of these three modes as uh, in 14:11 to 13 he says. Prakasham cha pravrittim cha. So he says first, he describes three words, one one word for each of these modes. So prakasha is illumination, pravritti is hyperactivity, 
and moha is delusion is confusion so he says sarvadware shu dehe smin prakash upajayate gyanam yada tada vidya vridham sattvam ityuta so when the mode of goodness is increased then there is illumination that's prakash that is the characteristic of the three modes i'll explain what this means but let's look at the three verses first then he says lobha pravrittirarambha karmana masham aspruha rajasye tani jayante viruddhe bharatarshabha so he says pravritti there is greed there is insatiable desire and there is the urge for hyperactivity do this do this do this and do that and do that so that is the mode of passion and then the mode of ignorance is aprakasho apravrittischa ado moha evacha tamasye tani jayante vivruddhe kurunandana so aprakasho apravrittischa that when there is neither uh, there is neither proper illumination nor there is proper action there is just delusion moha evacha so that is in the mode of ignorance so if we consider at this stage things that uh, things that are con- of concern for things that matter to us but things that are in our control it's best to focus on those things then we can do something constructive but if we start working on the things that matter to us but that are not in our control then we dissipate our energy on we could say that we are uh <clears throat> we are you we are uselessly busy we are uselessly busy we are busy but we what we are doing is not of much use for us but worse is that when we are aprakasho aprvrittischa we are not even doing much nor are we nor neither our activity nor our focus is on the things that matter to us and things that are in our control it's just that just things so for example uh, na uh, we might just get distracted lost in our own uh, lost inside our head so this may lead to panic for example or fear or paranoia i just feel powerless and overwhelmed by fear or especially in today's digitally connected world we might lose ourselves in mindless entertainment now for now we might get caught in the social media and look at this update and look at that and look at that now it is imp- it is important that we stay updated and we we stay well informed about situations that matter to us but in today's world there is so much information that bo- can come to us from so many sources and of how much use it is we may not even think of that oh you know, this happened in this part of the world that happened in that part of the world that happened in that part of the world certainly we need to stay aware but we need to have a sense of proportion and perspective that means a sense of proportion and perspective means hello i'm i'm giving a class can we talk later i'll be busy for about 45 minutes thank you so mm, so we need a sense of purpose and perspective by which uh, we can uh, uh, see things properly now one way to understand is you can consider the information action ratio that the information that i am getting how actionable is it so uh, when we are in the mode of ignorance one way we might get d- distracted is by just uh, by just entertainment that has nothing to do with our actual reality but sometimes entertainment might be uh, the distraction might be in the form of information oh this happened here that happened there that happened there and nowadays with um, so much fake news coming in it may be difficult for us to even know actually what is happening so information action ratio means that okay whatever i am reading i am talking about how much of it is actionable for me sometimes it might be that the ratio might be point not 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 one we might read a, read a thousand uh, 
notifications and then maybe one of them contains something which is of relevance to us so then we are actually wasting a lot of our time so the more so now uh, depending on the mode that we are in our vision gets directed in particular directions in the mode of goodness we focus on what matters to us but also what is in our control so now uh, vishwanath chakra thakur in uh, in the in the uddhav gita commentary uh, is in the uh, he talks about how much are the modes in our control that means that at uh, in the 14th chapter of the gita krishna analyzes the three modes and then he says how nanyam gunebhya kartaram yada drashta anupashyati gunebhya cha param veti madbhavam sodhi gachati he says actually nanyam gunebhya kartaram that there is no doer apart from the three modes yada drashta anupashyati the wise who sees in this way that that there is there is the mode you are doing things and then i as a uh, seer gune bhyas cha param vetti i as a spiritual being exists beyond the modes and there is the supreme lord who also exists beyond the modes and when rather than obsessing over what is happening in the modes we raise our consciousness towards the lord who is beyond the modes and connect with him and mad bhavam so digachati that person will attain my abode that person will attain my spiritual nature will attain me so the idea is that when we are uh, when we can understand our existential situation then we can act effectively so the more shape our perception of the situation and then they shape our action what we do in the situation basically when we consider the world we interact with the world broadly in two ways we take in information from the world through our gyana indriyas and then we act in the world through our karma indriyas so now our consciousness can be seen both as uh, as light energy and motor energy or electrical energy so light when it say from a flashlight a light goes out then we can see what is happening outside what is what is happening wherever the uh, wherever that light focuses we can see what's happening over there but then uh, that's not the only function of consciousness you know, whatever we are conscious of that's what we uh, we perceive we might be so right now you might be here you might be hearing this but if your consciousness is uh, caught in apprehension or uh, anxiety about certain things then although the sound is going in your ears but it's like the light of awareness is not over there it is somewhere else so you don't really perceive it so consciousness one way the consciousness interacts is what we focus on and then consciousness also like electrical energy we could say electrical energy makes things happen or we could say if we are in a car a car has a flashlight by which we see things but the car also has the whole fuel now now most they now are using natural gas there are some some vehicles which are uh, say work on bat uh, work on say elect we say suppose electricity so there's a fuel which goes into the car and that causes the car to move so consciousness does both these things consciousness acts as light of awareness and cause consciousness is also the energy for action and both of these need to be uh, the light of awareness and the energy for action Uh, and both of these need to be channeled constructively to the extent they are channeled constructively to that extent we can uh, function purposefully in our lives and in today's world especially now they, we just operate the light of awareness and the energy of action without even thinking much about this because often our focus is not on consciousness itself but on the object of consciousness that means we focus on the things on the outer world not on what we are focusing on the outer world but it is when our normal life gets disrupted 
that is the time we start thinking hey uh, what is in my control so when we experience situations of extreme disruption in the physical world that is the time when we are forced to think okay okay what what is in my control if our consciousness is only caught in the physical level of reality then basically we have two modes of functioning one is either that phys that physical reality is in our control and we feel confident even over confident or we feel that physical reality is not in our control and then we feel powerless so this is basically you could say the fight or flight response the fight or flight response is the fight response is in rajoguna and whatever is happening i'm going to fight it i'm going to conquer it and the flight response is hey this is so difficult i can't do anything about it now flight can happen sometimes when we literally run away or flight can also mean we become we just feel i can't deal with it and we we become paralyzed so both can happen in the mode of ignorance so for us in today's world we have to learn consciously or guide ourselves consciously uh, to to become consciousness conscious to become consciousness conscious that when especially our capacity to go outside is restricted at the, that is the time when we can take that as an opportunity to go inside to go inside means to become more self aware now when we go inside what does that mean literally sometimes you may have heard of some adventure stories where say some treasure is there in some place but the treasure is surrounded by maybe scary snakes which uh, which the person who tries to get to a treasure the snakes attack and the person might be killed over there so sometimes people uh, so most people even if they know there is a treasure they see that snake they get so alarmed by it that they just give up and go away so similarly for us when we go inside you know, at the core of our inner world is the soul and there is krishna and that is a spiritual treasure but surrounding that is the mind and the mind along with the senses are like those terrible weapons terrible snakes manashashthan indriyani prakriti sthani karishati so the mind and the senses they are like serpents kala sarpa as we say or <clears throat> our desires are sometimes compared to senses our senses are co compared to serpents sometimes our senses are compared to serpents but the point is that there are these serpents and they start biting us they start biting us means that if we start going inward say if we if we are alone with our thoughts and our thoughts can drive us crazy they can make us go completely mad when we are alone we are often alone with our mind so when we try to go inside if we try to go to our mind if we we end up with our mind so that means we get go inward but we get only to the snakes not to the treasure then it feels unbearable and when it feels unbearable what do we do oh, i just want to get out of this and then we just come out so for most people because their minds are so wild and uncontrolled going inside is quite difficult now occasionally you're sitting down closing your eyes and trying to take some deep breaths seems fashionable and it's uh, it's good if that calms us down but we need to actually uh, learn to go beyond our mind to the soul to the to the to the spiritual level of reality and sometimes we don't do that even when we are practicing bhakti we often use bhakti 
as a means to run away from our mind not to go beyond the mind now what do i mean by run away from the mind that means that say if somebody is somebody has nothing to do and they are alone and they start getting bored and their mind starts fantasizing what if this happens what if that happens and then they start getting paranoid what do they do because of that just turn on turn on their phone or turn on their laptop turn on their television and start binging on some kind of entertainment <laughs> entertainment channels like net, net entertainment app portals like netflix and others you know they have increased they have experienced in the last few days a huge increase in uh, in <clears throat> in people coming over there now india over the last year or so has become the biggest consumer of data in the whole world per capita although there are large parts of india which don't have basic needs but uh, but even in the rural india where there is no where there is no proper electricity because of uh, the jio making data available very cheaply there is huge consumption of data now at one level it's good to be connected you know if we are we can stay connected with our loved ones of where they are and what they are doing so to have some phone or whatsapp or whatever connection is good but this doesn't require huge amounts of data so this huge amount of data is being used just to uh, at one level let's run away from the physical reality so here i will complicate some things a little bit i talked about the spiritual level where the soul then there is the mind and then there is the physical reality so now uh, the physical reality itself is is sometimes very alarming like it is right now most of the time the physical reality can just be boring and even for us at this stage if we are not immediately threatened by the uh, by the corona virus not per say if we are not infected if we are some loud one is not infected then for us we are physically immobilized so there is the danger but the danger is not immediate what is much more constant for us is the inactivity and the boredom that is caused by it and that boredom can become burdensome and then what happens because of that is we need some escape so the the digital world which uh, it provides us an alternative at the level of the mind at the level of the mind when it provides us alternative then we get caught in that and it can become endlessly distracting now again uh, and here I, i once gave a whole class on internet in the three modes and i am not in any way criticizing technology itself but it is ultimately the technology is a reflection of us it is we who use technology the uh, how we use it that depends on us but the difference between the physical world and the digital world is twofold that in the physical world there are things in goodness passion and ignorance and on the internet there are things in goodness passion and ignorance <clears throat> and just as the world today is largely in the modes of passion and ignorance so there is on the internet also um, we could say there is a large large amount portion of content is in passion and ignorance and of course there are there is a lot of content we could say in goodness there is educational content there can be spiritual education there can be material education and just as in the real world we can have all kinds of people so in the real world there are some people who are helpful uh, some people who are just self centered and some people who are almost destructive so like that in the in, in the internet digital world also there are people who are helpful there are say online help forums that people can make in general times also we can have let's say there can be if you have a problem with your computer you can have online forums where you can ask questions and get answers in times like the crisis people can form online help groups so that's how people can uh, you people so there can there can be people in goodness who use the internet for purposes of goodness there can be people in passion i said entertainment is in passion and goes toward ignorance 
and there can be people in ignorance where people spread rumors uh, some people the, the 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 biggest talent in their life is to spread rumors about what they believe someone has done somewhere and such people who spread rumors you know there is a i recently read a definition of gossip now when does gossip begins gossip begins when we hear something we like about someone we don't like when we hear something we like about someone we don't like so there are people who who just spread uh, misinformation so so there is entertainment and then there can be on the internet there can be predators predator there are literally people who are uh, digital predators they may prey on children or something like that there can be abusers so we can have the entire spectrum of humanity in the digital world as we may have in the physical world the difference is twofold in the physical world to go from the mode of say goodness to the mode of ignorance it requires some time effort and there is some social constraint in it say if somebody is going to a temple and from there they go to a bar then they go to a bar or a casino or something like that then they have to physically go from there and people observe it and there is a certain amount of uh, social constraint that come because of having to physically go from one place to another but in the digital world you know in one moment by just one flip of button we can go from goodness to ignorance so the physical world and digital world they are similar in the sense that they offer the same spectrum uh, at one level but the shifting from one to the other is very very quick and easy and our mind tends to choose the path of least resistance we choose the path of least resistance that means if we have not during our bhakti practices cultivated a certain amount of goodness cultivated a certain amount of attraction toward krishna then for us this uh, i told earlier about how a treasure is hidden by the snake uh, and the snake can seem quite threatening so if we have not tasted that treasure if you have not relished that treasure if you have not felt enriched by the treasure of devotion sufficiently then the snake fighting the snake appears so threatening that we just we just do away with it just don't uh, we just don't do much about it so for example I, i started earlier by saying how in our practice of sometimes we may practice bhakti not to go beyond the mind but to run away from the mind what does that mean that means that even in bhakti there are a lot of externals uh, in in a given spiritual society some people may come more for socializing than for spiritualizing their consciousness so even when that happens then there can, uh, there has to be some basic amount of courtesy and social connection but then there is endless chit chatting about this person did this and that person did that and although we might be in social uh, spiritual circles but we may not be in spiritual consciousness so now it is an opportunity for us to go really inside when physically we can't go outside much either we can just get irritated that of because of the imposed immobility on us or we can take that as a opportunity to seriously go inside so so sometimes we might be using bhakti also although bhakti ultimately means just meant to connect us with krishna but if we are not really confronting our mind challenging our mind changing our mind then what may happen is that we might just be using the bhakti to run away from the mind so but when we can't run away physically we can't get caught up in physically distracting things which seem spiritual but which are not actually spiritual then that is the time when we can go inward so to go inward is to go beyond the mind to the soul go beyond the mind to krishna and the bhagavad gita says that this is this is the nature of the happiness in goodness that yatad agre vishamiva 
Parinameyamritopamam That which tastes like poison in the beginning will taste like nectar in the end. So poison in the beginning is the consideration of the mind and its many priorities. Although bhakti itself is transcendental, we might be practicing bhakti in a mode of hyperactivity. But now this is the time uh, we can we can move from the passionate practice of bhakti to a practice of bhakti more in goodness, and ultimately we will move toward transcendence. In the Bhagavatam, in the uh, in the third canto where Lord Kapila is instructing Devahuti, there he talks about how bhakti itself is transcendental, but bhakti can be practiced within the three modes. So I'll conclude with that part and then we can have a few questions if there are any. That he says there that bhakti which is practiced in the mode of passion, ignorance is basically hinsatmaka. That there is, now we may not have physical violence, physical aggression against others, but there can be verbal aggression. Verbal aggression is where it, we just consider any person who disagrees with us as absolutely wrong, as someone who is just into, who is, uh, we start demonizing people who disagree with us and we become verbally very aggressive, very abusive. So <clears throat> I remember once that I was at a, uh, I was part of a mediation where two, pe two people were, two devotees were having some quarrel and one devotee said to the other devotee, you know, I know, I know you are angry with me and this other devotee, you can use the word devotee even in double quotes over here, said, I am not angry with you. Sometimes uh, we are angry but we are not, we are in denial of our anger, so I am not angry with you. Anger is an expensive emotion and you are not worth it. So, this is dehumanizing the other person. And if we start dehumanizing the other person, then we can't really do anything, uh, then we can't resolve the issues at all. So, in the mode of ignorance, uh, when we are dominated by it, then we, 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 Although we are practicing bhakti, we may be even be sharing, we may say that we are protecting bhakti or practicing bhakti purely, we may demonize other people completely. So when we are practicing bhakti, we need to, our practice of bhakti itself is transcendental, but our practice of bhakti needs to come more toward goodness and then toward transcendence. So if we take this as an opportunity to do more inner homework, that means what it is that is real really matters to me what is it that is uh, you know, what are the say if you consider three circles things that don't matter to us things that matter to us but are not in our control things that matter to us and are in our control now, we focus even within bhakti we are sometimes get caught in lots of things if if we are practicing bhakti in the mode of ignorance even within devotional circles we get caught in various things that are not in our control uh, and that don't even matter to us. Sometimes we start arguing with people over things that, that are not at all important. And sometimes we may get caught in a lot of things, but they, they are not really important for us. We are caught in hyperactivity. But what is it that is in our control? The bhakti is primarily the process of inner transformation, the process of desire transformation. And that means we have to confront our mind and then we have to go beyond our mind. And rather than getting, now we have, we may get at this stage when physically we are restricted, we might become agitated and resentful. Why can't I go outside? Why is my physical movement restricted? Or we can escape from that and go into the digital world. And now, now going into the digital world to grow spiritually is good. But if you are going into the digital world to just escape from physical reality, from from the boredom of the physical reality and from the agitation of the mental reality, then that can put us into further illusion. But if we see this as opportunity for aligning our ourselves with 
the things that matter most to us so this is a part time we can take to make some serious commitments to go deep in the practice of par bhakti it could be sometimes in terms of increase in the quantity of certain devotional activities which we are doing we might decide to maybe chant uh, maybe chant some extra rounds or decide to read some specific shastra to substantial quantity we might this is a time of great danger so we may decide that some narsimha mantras like the narsimha kavach mantra or whatever uh, we may decide to recite, recite it regularly for our protection for the protection of our loved ones for the protection of our devotee community but if we make some tangible uh, commitments in that way which take us beyond the mind to the level of the soul now what specifically to do that can vary from person to person but if we do that then we will find that this can become a period for enrichment for in spiritual enrichment where we understand our core where we understand our real values and our life becomes more aligned with those values and when we are act, when we reach that well spring of strength and peace within us when we when we act from that place of inner security when we are grounded when our home is a sanctuary within us then even our actions will become more purposeful our actions will become more positive our actions will become more powerful even within the powerless situation we are in we will act in ways that at the very least don't worsen the situation and on the positive note that become that improve that situation now with the outside the world may be dark but within us the light of krishna is there and that light of krishna tesham evanu kampartham aham gyana jamtama nashayami atma bhavastu gyana deepena bhasvatah in 1011 krishna says gyana deepena a light knowledge the light of knowledge so krishna says that this light of knowledge he can he can turn it on in our hearts and then if that light of knowledge illumines our heart it will illumine not just our heart but through us it can illumine our corner of the world and not and how big that light can be that that we don't know in fact you know there are lights which are some light which is of say uh, it can give a, it can just illumine us one part of the room some illum, light can illumine a whole room some illumine light can like there are flood lights which are in stadiums which can illumine a whole stadium so each one of us if we connect with krishna deeply and we become illuminated by that krishna can make us into a flashlight or krishna can make us even into a flood light now how krishna wants to use us that's up to him how much our own life can be illuminated and our corner of the world can be illuminated that depends on how well we connect ourselves with krishna so prakash prakash can be in the mode of goodness prakash can also be in transcendence when it is by our own analysis and our control of our mind the prakash the illumination that comes is from goodness but when we become connected with krishna by the practice of our bhakti then the prakash is the gyana deepa that krishna has lit, lit from within us that illumination is krishna lighting our inner world and lighting our outer world through us so we all can become by the serious practice of bhakti in this time of adversity we all can become channels for krishna's light to manifest in us and through us in the outer world so i'll summarize i spoke today on how the the how the modes shape our perception of our situation i talked broadly in three parts first i talked about our existential situation within uh, the three modes the uh, so i talked about how we are souls and we are caught in this world and arjuna the bhagavad gita gives us a very unemotional kind of spirituality because emotions were coming in the way for arjuna and the the purpose of the dharma is the purpose of spiritual knowledge is to help us function effectively so i talked about the body mind and soul so consciousness is the like the light of awareness that comes from the soul through the mind to the world and it is like the energy or the electricity for action 
that comes through the mind to the outer world and the modes affect all of reality but primarily they affect our mind and when they affect our mind uh, we talk i talk about three circles that the things that are in our control things that matter to us and things that don't even matter to us so in mode of in the mode of goodness prakash there is knowledge that the light of awareness is good then we can focus on that which is in our control and act constructively in the mode of passion just we uh, caught in hyperactivity doing things without considering how much how effective we are or whether what we are doing is relevant or not and then sometimes we may get caught in the things that don't even matter that is just being distracted completely so that is so pravritti is hyperactivity and moha is simply delusion so uh, when we are caught in the three modes then sometimes our practice of bhakti also becomes a uh, means uh, becomes uh, dominated by the modes and we don't really go deep within so going with this deep within i talked about how there is the mind and uh, the beyond the mind is the soul so the soul is like a hidden soul and krishna and the relationship like the hidden treasure but the mind is like a snake or a set of snakes which guard that hidden treasure so we need to go deep within but most of the times because we can't go deep because it's too difficult to deal with these snakes we just go outside so even our practice of bhakti or sometimes becomes more of not spiritualizing spiritualizing our consciousness but it's just socializing and then we may get caught in gossip and distraction within practicing bhakti also and in today's world there is the physical and there is the digital so uh, we may get distracted if we are not physically mobile that can frustrate us and then we may get caught in the digital world the digital world the is like the physical world in the sense that there are three modes but the big difference is that uh, we there is far more accessible physically there are only so many places we can go to digitally goodness passion and ignorance all three become much more accessible to us and digitally we can switch from goodness to ignorance within one moment and that's how we can be more vulnerable so rather the last part i talked about is rather than resenting that we are physically uh, restricted in our moment or uh, or just losing ourselves mindlessly at the digital level we can confront ourselves we can confront our mind and go beyond the mind to the soul so rather uh, rather than just uh, being in a mode of hyperactivity or passivity if we can gain inner use this time to gain inner clarity we can't go outside but we can go inside beyond our mind to the soul then we can become internally enriched by the committed practices of bhakti and then the light of krishna's love of krishna's wisdom of krishna's compassion can manifest through us it can illumine our hearts and it can illumine our outer world and whether we uh, the illumination we offer is a small flashlight or a huge flood light that depends on how in seriously we connect with krishna and how krishna uses us as instruments of his compassion but even amid this darkness each of us can be uh, so uh, can be a channel for light small or big thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions or comments okay so the question is since we all are at different levels and we are also in a situation that is unpredictable in its length so how can we uh, get more involved more connected with krishna <clears throat> the whole mood of the bhagavad gita is that you know, there is we could say progressive elevation in the 12th chapter krishna talks about various levels of the practice of bhakti from 12:8 to 12:12 12:8 he says mayeva mana dhatsva mai buddhim niveshaya nivasishya si mayeva ata urudvam na samshaya let your mind and intelligence be absorbed in me and then he says it's not that you will attain me you are already in me by that and then he says if you can't do that ata chittam samadhatum na shakno si mai sthiram abhyas yoge na tato mam ichcha tum dhan anjaya you get a desire for attaining me by conscientious practice of bhakti so you could say there is spontaneous practice of bhakti and there is conscientious practice of bhakti 
and below that he says then you if you can't do that then you work for me work for me means that you act in a way that you do some service for me if you can't work for me then krishna says work for some good cause and at least learn some level of selflessness so krishna gives multiple levels at which we can practice bhakti we can become spiritually connected so not everybody krishna recognizes that we all are at different levels in our spiritual evolution and we shouldn't see a lack of seriousness as lack of sincerity that the two are very different things lack of seriousness is not necessarily lack of sincerity because seriousness is differently defined for different people so the um, say so the amount of the kind of books and the amount of study that a phd student will do will be different from what say a, a kindergarten or a primary school level student will do so the lack of we, can, we so the so the kindergarten or the primary student might also be equally sincere in study but their level of study may not involve the same quantity of commitment that may not have the same external characteristics of seriousness as the as, to, as the phd student may have but the idea is that from where we are we try to move forward so we some devotees may have a great taste for studying shastra and they might just decide i want to study for hours and hours but some of us we might barely be able to open our books and read or barely sometimes hear some talks so if that is the case then what can we do to hear more so from where we normally are we can take some steps forward and how much the steps can be forward that depends on our individual disposition it can also depend on our uh, our particular situation social familial professional but the key thing is from uh, krishna's perspective the important thing is not how much v- how far we have gone but how much we are moving ha that means somebody might be already halfway on the way to krishna but then they are stagnating over there somebody might be very far away from krishna 90% away from krishna but they are moving forward so what can comprise a step forward for a one person will vary from what may be a step forward for another person but wherever we are we move forward from there so that's why there has to be certain amount of in, uh, the there has to be a certain amount of individual responsibility we can we can as a community of devotees offer resources for people to grow spiritually but even after offering those resources what happens next is up to individuals and we need to accommodate that i suppose some people are not able to do certain things there some devotees might just said i want to chant some extra rounds i want to recite some extra prayers that is good but if they can't do that then that doesn't mean that uh, they are not sincere it might just be that we offer multiple resources to people at different levels and then people take up whatever resources they feel inspired by so we can provide e everybody the inspiration to raise their consciousness the specifics of how they raise and how much they raise their consciousness that can that can and will vary from person to person and if we become very judgmental about this if we start uh, praising too much one form of uh, one way of raising one's consciousness then others who can't some who can't do that will become too discouraged and turned off so we need to accommodate everyone prabhupad was prabhupad was expert in encouraging different devotees uh, devotees who were involved in uh book distribution property or nothing pleases me more than book distribution devotees who are involved in the farm community they said this is what is required for the future of the world devotees who are say building temples for him said this is going to be the most this is going to be the nothing is more important than this for us this is this is going to be the future of our in the juhu temple property this was the most important project at times property said so the idea is that prabhupad considered each project important each service important and inspire devotees so what prabhupada told devotees is that what will please you most is you love krishna so that love for krishna will express itself 
by moving from where we are further toward Krishna. How we do that specifically, that will vary from person to person. And we need to provide that multiplicity of approaches for people to come toward Krishna. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Is there any one last question? And we can stop. So at one, so how do we channel our mind to focus on Krishna amidst this situation? Yes, uh, so we are in an, we are in the material existence which is like an ocean, is a bhava sagar, and currently we could say sometimes the ocean is calm, sometimes it is there are gentle waves, and sometimes there is a, there are turbulent waves. So we could say at present we are in a phase where the waves have become quite turbulent and so, so it's all if we are in the ocean we can't fight against the waves we can't stop the waves that's impossible so this is uh, it's, it's a thank you for asking this question because this helps me to address one point that krishna after analyzing the modes he says how do we how do we what do we do about the modes he says that by unflinching practice of bhakti we go beyond the modes. So maam chayo vyabhicharena bhakti yogena sevate sagunan samati tyaitan brahma bhuyaya kalpate this 1426 the second last verse of the of 14 chapter which talks about the modes. So but now he says that if you practice bhakti unflinchingly avyabhicharena then we will be able to transcend the modes but then that simply begs the question that actually it is it is the modes that cause breakage in our bhakti because we are overwhelmed by say passion or ignorance that's why we our bhakti gets interrupted so if we are told that by practicing unbreaking devotion we can transcend the modes that seems to be like an unworkable solution so what is going on over here he said that uh, Krishna is saying that you practice unbreaking devotion, then you will go beyond the modes. But it is the modes which cause breaks in our devotion. So how do we go beyond it? So the idea is we can see that we are in an ocean and the waves in the ocean are like the modes coming and hitting us. So we can't stop the modes. But what we can do is we can hold on to an anchor and um, krishna can be understood in two different ways see krishna is our destination krishna resides in the spiritual world and he is our destination we want to attain krishna so if you become purely krishna conscious then antakale cha mameva smaran muktva kalevaram yah prayati samad bhavam yati nasti atra samshay i says you will attain me if you remember me Ma meti so Arjuna. So, in, so when Krishna uses this sense, Ma meti so Arjuna, for example, he's talking about Krishna as that he is our destination. So it's like we are in the ocean and then we swim and get to the land, to the shore, to the land, and that is where our destination is. But Krishna is not just restricted to the spiritual world. Krishna is not just our destination, he is also our companion. He's present in our hearts as the super soul. So the Bhagwan aspect of Krishna is transcendental, the Paramatma aspect of Krishna is also transcendental but he doesn't exist beyond the world he exists inside the world in our own hearts so there is transcendence means the existence of God beyond nature and there is immanence the existence of God within nature so Krishna is also our companion so we could say Krishna is not just the the shore beyond the ocean Krishna is also the anchor that we can hold on to within the ocean. So within the practice of bhakti, we find out certain things that we feel uh, connected with, we feel inspired by. So if we envision two circles, the circle of things which we like to do and a circle of things that are, are good for us, that comprise bhakti. Now the circle of things that are that we feel good about and that are good for us. If these two circles were identical, life would be wonderful. 
बट दे आर नॉट आइडेंटिकल ऑल्सो दे आर नॉट आइडेंटिकल दे आर नॉट कंप्लीटली डिसिमिलर ऑल्सो देर इज सम प्लेस वेयर द इंटरसेक्ट एंड वेयर द इंटरसेक्ट इज वेयर वी कैन फाइंड आवर एंकर सो इफ समबडी लाइक्स लाइक्स म्यूजिक then and then bhakti also has some music so now they if they come to a temple they come to satsang now for them the key thing is not so much uh, not so much uh, the class but the kirtan so that that can be their anchor now in bhakti there are different limbs and we need to practice all the limbs but when we have some time in our hands then we can focus on uh, those things that we can most easily connect with so when the wave starts hitting us uh, when krishna says practice unbreaking devotion that he is not telling that you have to fight against the wave that's impossible but we can fight to hold on to the anchor suppose now sometimes it's like somebody is in a ocean and there is a big wave big uh, ship nearby which is there for rescuing them but you can't just simply hold on to the ship sometimes people uh, they throw a lifeline for them now the lifeline we have to hold on to it so we have to find out which limb within bhakti we can get the firmest grip on so krishna is not just the uh, shore beyond the ocean krishna is also the ship in the ocean which will take us to that shore and within that ship if we are say in the ocean we want to get into the ship or we want to hold on to the ship so which part of that ship can we hold on to we have to find that out ourselves and we have to hold on to that rupa goswami has written a, a second part of bhakti samrat sindhu or the extension of that concept of rasa which he calls as uh, which is called the ujwal nilamani and there he elaborately talks about a concept called uddeepan uddeepan is spiritual stimulus just as each of us may have particular sense objects that may agitate us if say we are interested in very much in cricket or we are interested in chess or we are interested in if we are playing a particular sport uh, then hearing news about that that sport uh, stimulates us agitates us and other sports don't agitate us that much so just as we may have particular sense objects that uh, activate uh, that uh, agitate us that captivate us similarly there can be spiritual sense objects that will captivate us so for some people it might be kirtan for some people it might be shloka recitation for some people it might be deity worship for some people it might be hearing classes and not just hearing classes for it might be more specific i want to hear on this subject on this book maybe this speaker so we have to take inventory of our hearts to find out what are our uddeepans and then hold on to that uddeepan and this is the essential meaning of yena kena prakarena mana krishna nimeshet although the highest level of bhakti is just we absorb ourselves in krishna entirely for krishna's pleasure but we can't because our modes are so turb- so strong within us we can't be at that level constantly so we need to find out somehow or the other let me hold on to krishna so what is the lifeline that i can hold on to what is it that lies for me in between the circle of things that i uh, things that are good for me and things that i feel good about so we don't want to go only into the circle of things that we feel good about because that can be distracting and degrading for us but we can't just be in the things the uh, circle of things that are good for us if they don't feel good then life will seem like just endless austerity and that will be exhausting so to avoid the exhausting as well as the degrading we need to f- find that circle point of intersection and anchor ourselves there does it answer your question so thank you very much for the thoughtful question and thank you for giving this opportunity to speak this is a difficult situation and i pray that all of us are given strength by krishna so that we can move forward uh, by his blessings and by the blessings of our acharyas shri prabhupada ki jai Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.